um, situation to be in. Okay, so now we're starting to record and uh, I think we're also live streaming. So a very warm welcome to everybody who is joining us both live and also in person. Uh, really great to have everybody back again this evening and well done, especially if it's your first retreat, you've actually made it through the first day. Sleepy or not, doesn't matter. <laughs> the main thing is that you're turning up and you're giving everything your best shot, if you like, although that's not a very Buddhist way to put it. So in the evening talks that I'm going to be doing, they'll only be short reflections, although I know that I sometimes underestimate how much I have to say. Um, <laughs> but I want to have a look at what we call the five indriyas, which are the five spiritual faculties or strengths or powers or even friends of the mind meditation. Courage of zest, of energy. Um, of wisdom and of skill in meditation. <clears throat> and uh, these five faculties, I don't know if any of you are familiar with them, are confidence, otherwise sometimes translated as faith or trust. I actually like to translate that one as inspired confidence because we need a little bit of inspiration, first of all, to actually take the first steps on the path. So it's more than just feeling confident, it's actually having that inspiration to take it further. And then the second one is um, energy, because obviously if we feel confident and inspired, then we want to put forth some energy. <clears throat> and energy includes a kind of dedication, a kind of commitment, and also some sacrifice, you know, actually giving something of yourself rather than just seeking to gain. And then the third one is mindfulness, the big kind of uh, teaching these days in secular circles and often emphasize more than any other aspect of the path, even in Buddhist circles. Um, but I really like to think of that more as kindfulness because it does include uh, right intention, the intentions of loving kindness, of compassion, and also of letting go, making peace with reality, not trying to fight. Be nicely translated to today as stillness. And uh, last week, when we did a Q&A session with the Venerable Jet Summer, Tenzin Palmo, uh, she was asked about that. She was asked how she would translate it. And she said that actually she'd probably leave it in the Pali because that way we're less likely to get kind of swayed by various people's interpretations and more likely to ask ourselves what it really is. How does it really feel? How would we define it? And it's something that grows gradually in the practice and you get a taste for as the mind settles down. So. And then the last one of these five indriyas of sp spiritual faculties is wisdom. Yeah, because this is really what the path is aiming at. It's not only about feeling peaceful, feeling blissful, having a sense of freedom and relaxation, but it's actually freedom from the defilements, freedom from greed, hate and delusion. So wisdom is something that actually changes our life, changes our behavior of body and speech and has benefits for ourselves and others, lasting benefits. Yeah. So that wisdom, of course, comes imbued with all the others and they all reinforce themselves. But because we have six days and there's only five injuries, I thought that I'd start this evening to talk about the beautiful, wonderful quality of the virtue which I don't know if it gets a bad rap in the West or in maybe heavily religious countries too, because uh, sometimes it can seem more like a moralistic code, but the Buddha didn't talk about sila or virtue in that way. He talked about it as a quality that's really the foundation for the whole practice, for the whole Eightfold Path. And the stronger that foundation, the stronger the building of wisdom, peace, stillness, and all the other wonderful, maybe even psychic powers can be. <laughs> We're not aiming for those things, but what we are aiming to do is to put the causes in place. And one of those causes, of course, is virtue. So with virtue, we're actually starting to purify the conduct of our body and speech. And if we want to purify our mind, we have to start with the coarser aspects of life, first of all. We can't just go straight to the mind if our bodily and verbal conduct is really out of whack. 
you know, because the first thing you'll notice when you sit to meditate is that you have lots and lots of regrets and remorse and your mind is just going in circles thinking what do I do to repair this situation or to repair the harm that I've caused or perhaps the harm that someone else has caused to you. So we develop this sila, this virtue as a foundation and sila or virtue is really um, goodness humanity, kindness, compassion, that quality that seeks not to harm oneself or harm others. And virtue is really the true beauty of a person, the true beauty of the heart. So you can see when you're around virtuous people that they shine, they have a certain glow, they have a, a gentleness, a sense of non-harm, and you feel safe around such people. You know that you can trust them. You know that they'll stay true to their word. One really beautiful um, thing that I enjoy about being on tour with Ajahn Brown when he does come to England, and hopefully he will come, he's planning to come again next year, is that he's always totally punctual. We actually have little um, games around it because <laughs> we say, okay, let's meet at, uh, I don't know, whatever time for the, you know, to travel to the evening talk. And uh, I'm like, I'm sure you'll be there right on time. He's like, okay, I'll be there at 7.25 and 36 seconds. I'm like, okay, I'll see if I can get there. <laughs> and usually both of us are always earlier than we say. And that's a sense of reliability, isn't it? You know, you make a promise, you say you'll be there on time, and then you actually endeavor to be there on time and not to keep people waiting. And it's so great, you know, because it gives us a lot of time. It makes everything relaxed and harmonious. And I know that I can trust that if he says he'll do something, he will. <laughs> so this is part of giving beings freedom from fear, freedom from enmity and affliction, yeah? And that's uh, what's described in the Anguttara 8, for those who are into the suttas, in Anguttara 8, number 29, the Buddha says that by basically abstaining from the destruction of life, from taking what is not given, from sexual misconduct, from false speech, and from taking intoxicants, one gives to an immeasurable number of beings freedom from fear, enmity, and affliction. And they themselves in turn enjoy an immeasurable freedom from fear, enmity and affliction. So it's not that we're only giving others a gift, we're giving ourselves a very beautiful gift as well. And hopefully in the meditation that we'll do shortly, we will have a look at how we can bring our beautiful virtuous conduct and the goodness of our lives up in our mind when we practice to empower, energize and give us confidence in our meditation. So we incline our mind in beautiful ways. There's also a basic principle that's very aligned to what Ajahn was talking about earlier, um, about right endeavor or right effort, the effort to abandon unwholesome states and cultivate the wholesome. And this is also a principle of understanding what is virtue and what is not. So this is from the Sevitabha Sevitabha Sutta, which means, um, to be cultivated and not to be cultivated. And that's in the Majjhima Nikaya. For those who really love these suttas, you can see it's a bigger version of Bhikkhu Bodhi's Social and Communal Harmony. This is like the real thing. So if there's one book you might want to start with, this is, or it may be the second book, this is a good bet. So in here, um, the Buddha gives a very, very simple formula so that you can tell through your direct experience, what is virtue and what is not. So he says, such bodily conduct or verbal conduct or mental conduct as causes unwholesome states to increase and wholesome states to diminish in one who cultivates them should not be cultivated. But such bodily or verbal or mental conduct as causes unwholesome states to diminish and wholesome states to increase in one who cultivates them should be cultivated. Okay, so it's very similar, isn't it, to the four right endeavors. We want to see that the wholesome are increasing, at least they're not diminishing, and the unwholesome are diminishing. So I think this is very beautiful because obviously it's completely free from any kind of um, religious dogma. 
you know we're not saying oh it's virtuous to believe in god or to believe in this teacher or that teacher we're not saying you'll go to hell if you don't um believe in those things we're not saying it's wrong to love whoever you want to love right it's not wrong to be gay or transgender or queer it's nothing to do with that it's more about how do we use our sexuality how do we use our speech and our body in in whatever way also how do we use our mind are we using it to harm ourselves and others or um, to protect and to bring happiness and peace to the world yeah to ourselves and others again so it's something that can be directly known yeah and if you see over time that your wholesome states beautiful qualities like loving kindness compassion patience forgiveness um acceptance you know less fault finding with yourself less fault finding towards others if you see that these things are increasing then you know that you're practicing on the whole virtuous conduct of body speech and mind and the retreat is a very wonderful time because just by virtue of being here and if you are maintaining the silence and you are developing mindfulness throughout the day, then your bodily and verbal conduct is going to be pure, is going to be perfect. You know, you can't actually break the precept of wrong speech if you're in silence, right? So you've got two thirds of the path. The other third of the path, of course, is the mental conduct and the conduct, um, the ways in which we use our mind, the ways in which we attend to people or to objects outside what we put in our mind and also um, how we perceive yeah how we frame our experience like if somebody does something that's irritating to you do you immediately assume the worst or can you frame it in a different way perhaps they're having a hard time um, perhaps you know they're not well or they're just tired and they didn't really mean what they said perhaps you interpreted it wrongly yeah so this is just a good thing to keep in mind, because even if you're not talking to each other, which I hope you're not, um, the reverberations of conversations of the past will probably be still happening in the mind. And we can choose, we have a choice at that time to think in positive ways or to frame things more negatively. And sometimes it might seem like, yeah, but we shouldn't be like having this kind of toxic positivity. Um, that's just kind of naive or that opens us up to maybe abuse or being taken advantage of. And that's true, you know, especially in actual day to day life. But while you're meditating, whatever thoughts and perceptions are arising are things of the past or projections into the future. And so there is actually not really much reality to those at all. You know, our thoughts and our memories can't really be trusted. The future definitely can't be trusted because it hasn't happened. And the only way you can experience the future is when it becomes the present. So depending on the way your mind works, you'll meet that future with a wholesome, positive, um, generous mind, or you'll meet that future with fault finding and discontent. Mm -hmm. So the point is we can't really trust our thoughts. So why not choose ways of thinking that uplift the mind? And this is where practices such as loving kindness come in and practices, as we'll do shortly, around our own goodness, our own virtue, which sounds quite um, against the grain, I think, for many of us who've been conditioned to see our faults. But it's just a way of using the mind to bring some uplift and joy. And as Ajahn said earlier, in answer to the question about, um, there was a question that said, what, how does courage Oh no, how do we generate the courage to let go? How do we develop that courage? And Ajahn hinted at happiness being the main reason. And that happiness stems from virtue. Yeah. I think, the I'm not sure if it's the first time in the gradual training, I think it actually is, um, that the Buddha refers to happiness is all to do with virtue. So he talks about maintaining wholesome acts of body, speech, and mind, and also performing wholesome uh, conduct, not only abstaining from unwholesome. And he says that if we do that, it leads to what he calls a blameless bliss. Yeah, you can already imagine what that might mean, not to have remorse, not to have regret, not to feel 
tormented by the things that have happened in your life or the think the ways that you behave and to go to bed feeling guilty and you know being really restless in the night so and and it's also not just the absence of those things it's actually a sense of integrity a sense of feeling that you're living a life aligned to your highest values aligned to the goodness in your heart you know and focusing on that goodness not letting it slip by because we can easily say oh it's nothing you know anyone would do that <laughs> I actually um today I realized that uh, actually yesterday um the people who I'm staying in their house they're not here at the moment but they've lent me a room and this big attic space to teach from and they'd left all this really dirty washing in the washing machine like it had been there for probably a long time <laughs> at least a week by the time uh they put it on and uh, it was quite stinky and not very nice. And um, and then finally they put it on a couple of days ago and uh, I wanted to use the machine. So I sent them a text and said, oh, do you want to come and pick up your washing? You know, kind of feeling like it's not my job to hang it out. right? <laughs> Especially because officially, according to the Vinaya, actually monastics aren't supposed to do errands for lay people particularly. Although I don't think that one's, you know, necessarily condemned. Um, but then yesterday I kind of realized that's quite stingy and it would be quite a nice thing to just hang it out for them, you know, rather than it staying in the washing machine and getting all smelly again. So myself and the other ladies staying here hung it all out to dry. And then today, because I had time and the other lady was at work, I thought, OK, I'm going to fold it all up nicely, put it on the radiators. Then when it's dry, I fold it up and put it out for them so they feel like it's all taken care of. And I thought, hmm, I wonder if that's a good example to share with the group. And then I thought, it's a bit strange, isn't it? Giving an example about myself. And then I remembered this lovely passage in the Visiddhi Magga that said, the deed is, but no doer of the deed is there. <laughs> and then it continues, Nibbana is, but not the person who enters it. And I thought that really relates to this practice of reflecting on one's own virtue. It's not that you're developing a big ego around it. You're actually just noticing, you're wisely reflecting on cause and effect. You're seeing, okay, this wholesome action has this and this result. And another um, principle that the Buddha says is that it should have pleasurable consequences, pleasurable results for oneself and for others. And so when I realized that, I thought, yeah, that has given some happiness and some pleasure to me because I enjoy having time for little chores. Most of the time I'm on the computer running a project and not having enough time for meditation. But today I could go more slowly and I could, you know, really take care of my environment. I also looked after some beautiful orchids that are in the bathroom. I'm starting to feel like green fingers for orchids now. I think they're just such beautiful plants. And uh and yeah, you know, it has pleasant results for me and it'll definitely have pleasant results for them when they see it all nicely folded up. So, you know, that's a, an example of where we could just kind of moan and whinge, ah, I want to do my washing, I've got to take all this dirty stuff out first, or we can just go the extra mile. Yeah, so I wanted to, I'm aware that time's running, but I wanted to just read out one of the most beautiful places in the suttas that talks about the positive aspects of virtue. And I know that many of you have probably heard this several times before, but that doesn't matter unless you're perfect already, in which case you probably wouldn't be here. <laughs> so this is just one lovely passage. It's in the Kandaraka Sutta, which is again, Majjhima number 51, where the Buddha speaks about the precepts that you've taken today, the abstinence, but he also speaks about the positive aspects and I think in Pali, it might be an Abhidhamma term, but it might be straight from the Pali canon. It's called um, var, Varita, which means like abstinence, and Charita, Sila. So there's these two aspects, one to do and one not to do. So, and this is in the context of monastics because it carries on beyond the basic precepts into all the minutiae of the Vinaya, but we'll skip that part. So, but just presume that this is talking to monastics in the beginning. So having gone forth, perhaps you've gone forth into the retreat situation. So you can consider that you've gone forth as well for seven days. 
and possessing the monastic training and way of life. Abandoning the killing of living beings, one abstains from killing living beings. With rod and weapon laid aside, conscientious and merciful, one abides compassionate to all living beings. So here you see that it's much more than simply abstaining from taking life, which I think most of us can probably do quite easily. But it's actually kind of noticing if there's a snail in the road and, you know, it's likely that a bicycle or a car will come past and thinking, OK, I'll just move it out of the way, you know. Or even an animal that you might feel afraid of, like a spider. I actually love them, but a spider did bite me, actually, this rains retreat. And it took about a month for the bite to disappear. But anyway, I still like them. I had about eight really big spiders in the room that I was sleeping in. <laughs> really quite big. And uh, yeah, one time one got in the bath and I removed it because, you know, it doesn't take much for these little delicate creatures to get harmed. So then the next one, abandoning the taking of what is not given, one abstains from the taking what is not, of what is not given. Taking only what is given, expecting only what is given. By not stealing, one abides in purity. So you can see that that is quite a humble state of mind, not expecting anything other than what you have right in front of you, right? So that starts to undermine that sense of greed and grasping and craving to get more then abandoning in celibacy one observes celibacy and hopefully you're all doing that on this retreat because you're not supposed to speak so i think and or have any contact with each other actually so hopefully you're all actually on at least six precepts uh, and then living apart abstaining from the vulgar practice of sexual intercourse so this is not really supposed to be a judgment, but it is talking about the refinement of the mind. And so in terms of that, and in terms of the higher training, obviously for monastics especially, we do try to um, have a relationship towards sexuality, which is reciprocal and which is respectful and which engenders um, genuine intimacy and love, genuine trust. So basically we're reliable again, right? And we keep our commitments to each other. So then the one on speech is very beautiful and I'll just read it straight out. Abandoning false speech, one abstains from false speech. One speaks truth, adheres to truth, is trustworthy and reliable. One who is no deceiver of the world. Abandoning malicious speech, one abstains from malic malicious speech. One does not repeat elsewhere what they've heard here in order to divide those people from these. Nor do they repeat to these people what they've heard elsewhere in order to divide these people from those. Thus, one is one who reunites those who are divided, a promoter of friendships, who enjoys concord, rejoices in concord, delights in concord, and a speaker of words that promote concord. Isn't that lovely? That's so beautiful, especially in these times when there's so much us and them. Abandoning harsh speech, one abstains from harsh speech. One speaks such words that are gentle, pleasing to the ear and lovable, as go to the heart, or courteous, desired by many and agreeable to many. So again, the power of speech. Abandoning gossip, one abstains from gossip. One speaks at the right time, speaks what is fact, speaks on what is good, speaks on the Dhamma and the discipline. And at the right time, one speaks words that are worth recording, reasonable, moderate, and beneficial. So in this particular sutta, it doesn't talk about abstaining from alcohol possibly because this person's already gone forth. I'm not quite sure why it's not there. <clears throat> but I think the positive aspect of abstaining from alcohol is really around developing clarity, developing um, clear perception and clear mindfulness, a brightness, a lucidity of mind. Yeah. And it's really <laughs> crazy, but uh, I told Ajahn Brahm this morning, I tell him everything, because that's one thing that we do do if we um, do anything 
anything good or anything a bit strange um, is that we had some tea the other evening and tea is tea, right? It's not uh, breaking the precepts in any way, but this was a very, um, I don't know, expensive for sure, kind of white tea from very old trees in China. Um, I think it's the pure kind of tea. So it's like a fermented tea, but it's the white tips, the bods. And uh, and the person I'm staying with, or who, whose house it is, comes here from time to time and, and makes this tea. And uh, perhaps it was a bit late in the evening, but I drank some of this and it was brewed pretty strong, much stronger than I would normally take it. Tiny little cups, like these tiny little Chinese cups, really small. And you're sort of thinking, come on, you know, more liquid. Anyway. <laughs> I drank it and started to feel kind of strange and then we read um, the effects of it and it said oh it will give you a warm and tingly feeling but in um, when it's brewed strongly it can be trippy and mildly narcotic <laughs> and this was definitely how I was feeling it was really really peculiar because when you're very sensitive and you haven't taken stimulants or anything close to like intoxicants for decades um, you really, you know, the effects of things are very pronounced and it actually kept me up that night and it was great at the time because I laughed so much and it was really quite amusing. The whole evening was quite, quite funny and quite unexpected. <laughs> but I noticed that yesterday I was, I really had a crash the other side and this was just tea, you know, this was just some kind of artificial uplift, slight high. And then the downside of that was that I felt really quite rough the next day. And this is what happens, you know, if we take anything obviously more strong than that. It's kind of borrowed happiness, even if there's any happiness to it at all. Um, you don't feel good the next day because it's not the kind of happiness that comes from within. So be careful of white tea, <laughs> especially the good quality stuff. <laughs> so I did want to finish by just saying a few words about the next type of virtue because it's important and it links into what was talked about today and that's the mental virtue otherwise known as sense restraint or my favorite translation is guarding the senses <clears throat> because again it's not only restraining the senses from anything that you shouldn't be looking at or that leads to you know negativity rising that stimulates and encourages greed and aversion and delusion but it's also about learning to use our senses in wise and skillful ways. So there's another little passage, and this time it's in the Dantabhumi Sutta, which is number 125 in the Majjhima Nikaya. Hopefully you'll buy this afterwards and get to know all these suttas in detail, because they are really interesting. And here, this happens after already having pretty good bodily and verbal conduct so then we're going one step further and looking at the way the mind works so the buddha says one guards the door of the sense faculties and then he describes how so on seeing a form with the eye do not grasp at its signs and features since if you were to leave the eye faculty unguarded bad unwholesome states of covetousness and grief might invade you. Practice the way of restraint, guard the eye faculty and undertake the restraint of the eye faculty. Then on hearing a sound with the ear, um, on hearing a sound with the ear, do not grasp at its signs and features, since if you were to leave the ear faculty unguarded, bad unwholesome states of covetousness and grief might invade you. Practice the way of restraint, guard the ear faculty, undertake the restraint of the ear faculty. And the same little formula carries on for the nose, for the tongue, for the body, <clears throat> and also cognizing mind objects. So we don't leave these things unguarded because covetousness and grief might invade us if we do. And covetousness and grief, it's, I think it's just a translation of the first two hindrances, which is craving and aversion. So this is slightly old fashioned language. But um, again, we're just protecting our mind. And uh, I think it's really obvious with things like hearing. I know for myself, I used to be very much into my rock music, especially as a teen. And uh, now we don't listen to music as monastics. But I can really see that, you know, what that it's a kind of channeling of an emotion. 
And sometimes that might be healthy because it helps to contain that emotion in a song which has a limited life and it has a sort of beginning and an end. But other times, you know, if you listen to really depressing kind of music, it, it just cultivates emotions in us that aren't very helpful and that weren't even there before because we resonate, right, with whatever emotion is being um, stimulated in us. So we can be careful around these things. And of course, later we can, and also on retreat, we can rein in the senses further. For example, you know, not looking at your mobile phones or scrolling through Facebook or, you know, depressing articles or excess news about the corona pandemic. Hopefully you're all pretty safe and contained for this time. So you don't really need to know. Because I think one of the problems of uh, the society nowadays is we're just so bombarded with sense data. Um, it really can lead to sort of an, a sense of overwhelm. And I know for myself, as someone very sensitive to these things, including tea, <laughs> um, I really need a lot of time to just rest my eyes, rest my ears, silence and, you know, time in meditation to balance all that out. So starting to notice how it feels to reign in the senses and to ground ourselves more and more in the body. Yeah? So we're not just pulled out into the world of sights, sounds, smells, taste, touch, but we actually start to come inward and feel the body sitting and ground some of those emotions that we might feel in the body, you know, because every emotion has a corresponding physical sensation somewhere in the body. And instead of being pulled by the kind of impulses and our cravings and our desires, we can just learn to stay. We can learn to rest with those feelings in the body. You know, there may be a slight restlessness, which is based on craving, for example. There may be a kind of boredom, which is partly associated with aversion, with not finding the beauty and the joy in the moment. And actually look at it, stay with it, experience what you're feeling right now. And notice, you know, when the mind starts to spin off into thoughts about that emotion or about that sensation that you don't enjoy and see how those thoughts can just consolidate it further and bring more suffering when we use our thoughts unwisely. I found a nice little quote, and I don't think this is from any Dhamma book, but all the same, I thought there was some wisdom here. It basically says that thoughts are like drops of water. When we think the same thoughts over and over, we have a little puddle. And then we get a pond and finally we create an ocean. If our thoughts are negative, <clears throat> we can drown in a sea of negativity. If our thoughts are positive, we can float on an ocean of love, wisdom, compassion and peace. So we can learn to see what our minds are doing yeah, and come back again and again to the experience of the present moment that is real, that's something direct and that's something you can experience. And for this, a basic grounding in the body meditation is really, really helpful. So as we continue to practice in this way, we gain more confidence. And that confidence in turn encourages us to keep practicing the sila. We keep practicing virtue. We find that our lives are getting happier. We're, um, you know, maybe having more friends. We feel like we're on the right path. And then our confidence increases. So the two things work together and tomorrow we'll be looking a little more deeply at confidence and inspired confidence and how to deepen that a little bit more through the way we reflect and the way we uh, use our mind. But for now, I'd just like to really encourage you to inspire yourself by reflecting on your own goodness. And we'll do that together in a little meditation for about half an hour or so. And at the end of that uh, meditation, please send questions in to Lenny. I think she's put a message in the box. But if you can wait, <laughs> please, until after the meditation, that would be great, because now is your time to practice mental virtue based on all the beautiful things you're already doing in, in your life. So I'll give you a couple of minutes to stretch, probably not to go to the loo unless you're desperate. <laughs> And just be kind to your body, asking your body how it wants to be positioned for this half hour of meditation.
I should probably have shared something really inspiring that I did instead of drinking too much white tea. <laughs> but this is what I'm like. I'm so open, you know. Uh, definitely, I'm not going to be hiding anything from anyone because whatever I do, it's just out there. So <laughs> Sometimes I think that's not a bad thing. What you see is what you get. So. <laughs> So settling into your posture. <clears throat> and when you're ready, withdrawing. Withdrawing the sense of sight. The eyes are not needed right now. So if it feels comfortable and safe for you, then you can gently close your eyes, turn off the light, <laughs> and allow at least the sense impressions of the eye to fade. Some people do keep their eyes slightly open. If that's you, that's totally fine. Any of these uh, suggestions and instructions are only that. They're just offerings, really, suggestions that you may take up or not. <clears throat> and with our eyes closed, we can just gently come in contact with our bodies. Establishing mindfulness along with kindness and care. <laughs> and you know that it's kindness if you have the intention to simply befriend whatever you experience in an accepting and non judgmental way. Kindness can feel like a relief. Most of our life, we're pushing ourselves around, pushing our bodies around, <clears throat> demanding that our bodies serve us in so many different ways. But now, the mind is in service of the body. Now it's time to simply be kind. And ask your body how it feels. Allowing this mindful, kind awareness, what Ajahn Brahm calls kindfulness, to soak through the body starting, if you wish, at the tips of the toes or at the top of the head. Doesn't really matter. But just imagining this kind, kindfulness. Like the light and warmth of the sun, just soaking you through, soaking through the skin. to the muscles below. Right inside. As far as it soaks naturally without any force. And just like the warmth and light of the sun, wherever this kindfulness flows, it relaxes, soothes, and calms any tension, any tightness, 
any unnecessary holding that you that you have in your body. Sometimes we hold that tension in our brow or in our jaw. See if you can imagine your brow just spreading outward. Allow your jaw just to part and maybe even drop a little bit. Checking that the tongue's not pressing. The shoulders can be another area of tension or tightness. You might wish to give them a gentle roll, roll back and allow them to drop downward. Checking that nothing is Pressing on your buttocks. That the weight is evenly distributed. And that your joints are at peace, at ease. Sometimes we cross our legs a little too tightly. So the knees feel strained or the ankles are pressing against the shins. Maybe your toes are squashed. See if you can give them a little bit more space. And then noticing your mind, befriending your mind. As though meeting your inner world with a smile. This person who you know so well, you know your own qualities, you know some of your faults. And too often, we're much more focused on our faults and exaggerate them out of all proportion. So see if at this time you can focus on the beauty within yourself. At the very least, developing a sense of gratitude for this beautiful gift of retreat time that you've offered to yourself. Out of loving kindness, out of wisdom. Understanding that practicing the Dhamma is for your benefit and the benefit of so many other beings. Well done. Tap into a sense of gratitude. Inner gratitude for this beautiful, generous offering that you've made to yourself.
How does that gratitude feel in your heart? Even if you're not feeling genuine gratitude and appreciation for yourself, just for showing up, can you remain open to the possibility of feeling gratitude towards yourself? How would that feel? Perhaps something else comes to mind as we reflect in this way, perhaps a little service that you've offered to someone that maybe didn't seem like much at the time, but nevertheless made someone else's life a little easier. Maybe even just a smile. Maybe you have a pet or a sick girlfriend who you're taking care of. Can you see that as something beautiful, an opportunity to care? To increase this foundation of beautiful, pure, virtue, selfless service to another human being or animal, or even a plant. Staying connected to your body and any sensations that you feel in any place, any part of the body. Noticing if these reflections bring a sense of peace, a sense of happiness, well being, or ease however subtle that might be. Resting in your own goodness. Confident that you're on the right path.
And as the meditation gets a little bit deeper, just let any memories or thoughts about particular activities fade away. And if you wish, see if you can tune in to a quality that you really respect in this world and maybe see signs of inside. Perhaps the quality of patience or courage, kindness, generosity, just settling on some quality that you really value and that your mind leaps toward. Recognizing that quality within yourself. If it helps to anchor the mind, you could even repeat that word, that quality internally to yourself just a few times, connecting to the resonance, to the energy of that quality and allowing it to suffuse your body and mind. Perhaps even allowing it to flow to the rhythm of breath. If that feels natural and pleasant to you.
We're coming close to the end of the meditation. Just connecting again with your body. And with the resonance of this beautiful quality that you have brought to mind. Imagine now that beautiful quality pouring out of your heart into your hands. An offering, the patience or the kindness, the generosity, whatever was your special quality, offering it out into the world. Imagining that quality suffusing everyone in this room. Bringing them freedom from fear. Bringing them courage. Happiness and peace. Perhaps sending it out to someone special in your life or someone who could be in need of that little extra support. Just allowing those perceptions to fade, coming back in contact with your body, sitting on the cushion or on a chair. Checking how you feel now, whether the mind is inclined towards goodness, wholesomeness, even a tiny bit in the short meditation, just to learn how the process of meditation works. And if you find that your mind is agitated or fed up, ask yourself why, just to learn the cause and the effect for various mind states to arise. Are you wanting something? Were your expectations of yourself just too high? And can you Commit to the practice of contentment with patience, with courage and dedication. Uh, I think I have a gigantic bell, but it's a bit far for me to reach. I'll perhaps play the bell tomorrow. <laughs> you don't have to open your eyes, but if you want, I'll ring a human bell. If you prefer to carry on, please do. Gong. 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 <laughs> 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 
<laughs> and even if you have your eyes open, don't throw away any peace or quiet that you've developed too soon. <laughs> See if you can stay connected to the body in some way or to your emotional world. So now is the time for any questions, comments, or hopefully not complaints. <laughs> so I think many will be the collector. So if you can please write your questions, comments, or questions or comments, <laughs> please do. And if you could keep them a little bit concise. Ideally related to your meditation practice and to this retreat, at least for the first days, and I'm sure that we can get deeper into the Buddhist teachings as we proceed. I'm not seeing any questions yet. Maybe you're all enlightened. <laughs> I'm still typing, which is good. Okay, I got six in one here. This is great. <laughs> Uh, so the first question is, what is the brand of the white tea that I drank? I'm not sure I should say that, but it's, uh, I don't remember. I mean, they're, they've all got very complicated names. It was something peony, but I really don't remember. And I definitely wouldn't advise to take it strong. <laughs> These are from, um, I think they're more or less directly from the suppliers in China. And this were was it a cherry tree? I forget. It could have, no, no, no. It's a tea, isn't it? It's not cherry tree. It's a tea tree. <laughs> um, but it was about one or two hundred year old trees. Anyway. <laughs> so someone's asking, should we read the word of the Buddha book during the retreat? <laughs> um, my sense of reading and studying during retreat is that a little bit can be helpful to inspire your practice. And it can take a little bit of skill to know how much is enough just to inspire and when does it go into distraction and um, spending a lot of time on the theory, more than you can chew. So I, it's interesting because my practice pretty much started with straight out meditation with not so much theory other than what I was learning from the teachers and within that context of retreat. And, um, and so I think for me, the teaching and the practice kind of developed together. And I think that was good for my particular character. Like I needed to know what the benefits were of the practice before I was really interested to dig deeper to the theory. But I do know some people who are very keen to get a very clear intellectual understanding first and that seems to motivate them to practice. I would imagine that if you're here on retreat you're already motivated to practice so it might not be so important to read the whole book. You have the book so you can read it any other time. I would probably say that it might be enough to have the classes once a day with Ajahn Brown, because I think when there's a teacher to help unpack some of the nuances and some of the um, relevance of those teachings in direct application to meditation, that can be the best of all. But um, it's not that you're not allowed to read it, you know, it's not, that's not the case. Um, but I think it's more important to maybe just perhaps go over some of the things we have been practicing or we have been speaking about and then see if you can See if it gives you that inspiration and guidance to sit. So I guess there's no definite answer there. It's more of an exploration, but do be aware of the tendency to distract and to get, you know, sometimes the mind's starting to wake up and you have quite a lot of energy in the mind. And then instead of putting that into your meditation, I've noticed I do this, my mind's quite energized. And I think, great, I can read a book and take it in so easily because my mind's bright and fresh. 
But actually, sometimes it's better to use that fresh, bright energy to look at the breath. So make sure you're not doing it from distraction. Have a check of what your motivation is around it. And then you can find a good answer. And that may be different at different times. So someone's saying, when I come out of meditation, it feels like waking up from sleep, like empty mind. Is that to be expected? Nothing is to be expected. Absolutely nothing. And then you'll always be surprised. It doesn't matter. It really doesn't matter. I think that is one experience that's possible. <laughs> there are many other experiences that are also possible. It could be that you've been asleep. It's probably not. It's more likely that you've just been quite peaceful and you come back and you feel refreshed, you know, and there's nothing much happening in the mind because the thoughts have died down and become a little bit stiller. So, yeah, it's absolutely fine. The most important thing is just to not to expect, but just to learn to embrace whatever arises and also have that sense of curiosity around it, you know? So not only looking at the experience and whether you enjoy the experience or not, but also a sense of curiosity as to how it arose. What were the causes that led to this effect? And that way we learn what the mind is about and how it ticks. And this is a big you know, part of the practice. I think even more so than getting into peaceful states, although those peaceful states can arise as a result of understanding our mind. So always see that the two go together. So empty mind is fine, busy mind is fine. Just have a look at, uh, don't have any expectation because it changes every single sit, most probably. And um, just see if you can relate to it with a sense of gentleness, kindness, and curiosity. I hope that helps. Please do ask follow-up questions if anything's not satisfactorily answered. Is there a way of blending meditation with reflecting on the day's teachings? Well, I kind of hope that's what we were sort of doing today. Um, and that was just one example, really, of how to use thought or use reflection, um, invoke certain moods, certain wholesome qualities, um, that do energize the mind and that do um, cultivate the wholesome states. So that was one example, and I kind of make it up each time. Um, generally speaking, I think it, for me, it can be really helpful to start the mind off by inclining it in a wholesome direction. So I tend to use either um, Chaganu Sati, which is what we just did, reflecting on our own generosity, our own goodness, or Silanu Sati is very closely related. It means reflecting on our virtue. Um, we could also use Buddha Dhamma or Sanganu Sati, reflecting on the qualities of the Buddha, the Dhamma, the Sangha. And as Ajahn Brown very beautifully um, reflected to us today, that when he thinks about the, the Buddha, he thinks about the quality of, what is it, wisdom. And when he thinks about the Dhamma, I mean, it doesn't matter which order, he basically pays respects to wisdom, peace and compassion, yeah? or virtue, peace and compassion. So these are qualities in the Buddha Dhamma and the Sangha. So what the essence of those things really are to you. Um, the general, you know, inclination of practice, the general um, leaning and what do you say like um, the way that we need to incline our practice is towards the wholesome states so it doesn't really matter how that comes about um, it can for some people just come about by simply connecting with their body and becoming more present in the present moment for other people maybe by allowing the breath to come in and just going with that you know almost like surfing the breath so yeah, I mean, I think you can develop your own methods and your own tools. And, you know, there's never one thing that works for everybody and that works for one person all the time. So be experimental, be creative. Um, don't get too much into the intellect around it. But the most important thing, is, I would say, is to blend the teachings of the second factor of the noble path with whatever we do. And that they are the teachings on right intention, the right relationship to our, our practice. So the second factor of the path is sometimes translated as right thought. I think right intention, right um, motivation, right relationship is uh, quite a good translation. And they are the attitudes or intentions of um, making peace, letting go. Yeah, that's one. Making peace with 
a situation, letting go of wanting it to be any other way than it is, um, otherwise known as renunciation, renouncing our desires, renouncing our ill will. Um, loving kindness, avyapada, which means non-ill will. So the intention to actually embrace what's arising in your body and mind rather than to change it or get rid of it or make yourself or your practice something other than it is. Yeah, Because sometimes we come to retreats wanting to um, deepen our meditation or maybe even wanting to improve ourselves. And in a way that's understandable, but be careful that it's not coming from a sense of ill will, a sense of fault finding and discontent with where you are already in the practice and with who you already are. Right, Because the whole purpose of the practice is to understand ourselves, to understand suffering, to understand the Dhamma, not to get an experience that we would like. And then the third one is non-cruelty, which can also be translated as um, compassion or even gentleness, patience. So are we relating to our meditation with gentleness and patience? Are we allowing it to unfold? Or are we trying to really grasp on to what's arising? You know, I must stay with the breath at any cost. That's not really being gentle. So we learn to treat even our meditation objects like friends. You know, so your breath, you can even imagine the breath like this very small little bird, you know, that's all fluffy, maybe a bird that's fallen out of its nest. And you're picking up this bird and holding it really gently in your hands. You know, you need to hold it tight enough to keep it there, just a very, very gentle touch, right? So that it feels protected, so that it feels cared for, but not so tightly that you squash that bird and break its wings or harm its feathers. So in a similar way, we can relate to the breath with kindness, with gentleness, without trying to make it any different than it is. Just give it that protective, kind awareness um, from the mind. And the same with anything that arises, even somebody asked earlier about anger and about giving anger some space. And I think, you know, even with that, I mean, giving it space might not be the best way to do it necessarily, but still we can be kind. We can sort of say, oh, anger, you've arisen. What is it that you need? You know, what is it that this anger needs right now? Or this person who's feeling the pain of that anger? Like, what is it that you actually need? Do you need to make the anger go away or do you need to listen to that anger and to find out where it's coming from, to find out if perhaps there's some pain or some hurt, and then respond with compassion. Because if you are experiencing so-called unwholesome states, in other words, states of mind that cause you to suffer, then you are in need of your own compassion, right? So rather than fighting with reality, fighting with our minds, we can actually learn to relate to them in quite radical ways, ways that are aligned with the Dhamma. Yeah, And by making peace with these things, gradually they lose their power over us. They lose their force. They lose their, um, their impact in the mind. We're just able to watch, just as though clouds are passing by. You know, We're just able to watch with interest and say, oh, look at what's arising now. How can I relate to that? And that's where the real cultivation lies. So I think that was quite um, not a very direct answer, perhaps, to your um, question, but hopefully um, over time you'll see how all these teachings tie in together anyway. And I would say just make sure you're, uh, as far as you can, learn to relate wisely to whatever arises and reflect. Yeah, sure, reflect in wholesome ways. Okay. In meditation, if I catch my mind wandering, um, if not bring it back to the breath, what do I do? Mental noting, sensation noting, and then back, back to Vipassana or Anapana. Thank you. So again, it's an experiment. There's no one answer. If there was one answer, then nobody's mind would wonder. I'd be able to give you the answer and everyone would put that answer into practice and no one would have any wondering anymore. But that's not the way it goes. Usually the mind is wondering because the mind has been very busy before. And, um, you know, we're, we're doing something we're not used to doing. We're trying to keep the mind in one place and the mind doesn't want to be kept in one place. Its nature is actually to wander about. So personally, for me, if I catch it wandering, I just accept that it's wandering. The fact that I know it's wandering at that time is already a sign that I'm aware. So it's not actually a problem. And if you do 
see that that's happening, you'll probably find your mind naturally um, becomes aware of its original object again. So if you were with the breath, it will probably come back to the breath. A, a more likely um, situation would be that you'll come back to the body because the breath is a very subtle thing. And I think it's better with breath meditation not to force the mind on the breath when it's not quiet enough to stay with the breath because that's when you can develop quite a, um, a fraught relationship with breath meditation. You know, when we're sort of immediately sitting down, some teachers teach you to go straight to the breath and the mind hasn't been prepared properly, first of all, by cultivating wholesome states and by just giving the mind time to settle down. You know, this is the first day of the retreat and it's impossible that your minds will all be completely still. I mean, I would say that's quite unlikely for any of us at any time in the retreat that, you know, there'll be a point that comes, that no more thoughts. <laughs> there will be thoughts from time to time. And I think, you know, especially in the beginning, one of the best things to do is just to simply give them time. So don't worry about them too much. Let them be there, but then just come back to an object that's easy to be with. So I would probably say come back to the body sensations. From the person asking the question, it sounds like you're used to noting and I think for me the word noting usually means reciting a word you know so coming back to the body sensation and actually saying pain or saying dullness or tension or warmth and that can be helpful in a way if it brings you in contact with the sensation but what you really want to be aware of is the sensation itself so if you do use the noting, if you find that helpful, just use it in the very beginning, but then see if you can actually feel into what that sensation is without the words. Yeah. So you don't really need to note. I mean, unless you really want to note. Um, that's more the Mahasi method. And I've practiced that a little bit, maybe for, I don't know, maybe six weeks ever in total, something like that. And it had its kind of purpose, but I found that it was a, uh, helpful in the first instant and then it was more helpful to let go of that and just feel what was happening feel it with the feeling part of the mind yeah at this stage if the mind's wandering a lot i wouldn't necessarily suggest pulling it back onto the breath i think just try to relax try to make peace with what's happening don't give the thoughts too much attention and um and just stay with the body relax the mind relax the body and bit by bit, those thoughts will quieten them down. But again, there's no exact answer, and it's probably a bit of trial and error. But as a general principle, I'd say people try a little bit too hard, and they try to fight their mind. So do be aware of that. Okay. Once you become aware of the experience of particular negative emotion of a particular negative emotion. How do you deal with it with, without reacting instantly, please? I mentioned body meditation. Can this be used? Absolutely. I'm just going to stop there for a moment because that is the only way that I know how to deal with it. I mean, um, I don't think it needs to be dealt with. Remember that if we're thinking of these emotions or the breath like little beings, we wouldn't really say, how do I deal with this little being? We'd more say, how do I relate to it? How do I um be with it yeah in a wholesome way so we don't have to deal with them we can just learn to meet them first of all and then to relate kindly to them so um <clears throat> there may be an instant reaction because that's what we've been doing all of our life so if you see yourself reacting instantly don't worry that just learn that oh look this is what happens when a negative emotion arises i react instantly you know in that there's already a lot of wisdom and a lot of understanding about what's happening in the mind and then i would say yes have a look at where it manifests in the body because for me at least if i do feel a certain usually kind of slightly abstract emotion so maybe there's a bit of heaviness or dullness or a kind of lack of energy at the moment that's what i'm mostly dealing with it's not very obvious where that is in the body but if I go to the area, generally with emotions, they tend to arise in the trunk. So between the stomach and the heart, somewhere here, because this is where the nervous system is. This is where 
um, we tend to hold emotions, not always, but I think, you know, with anxiety, for example, the stomach is often a place. Um, with sadness, it's often in the heart area. So what you could do is just very gently sort of say, oh, okay, you know, you've identified that emotion. And then just consciously have a look to see if there's any particular part of the body in which you feel that emotion. Or maybe there's a place that's not very obvious and just stay with it a little bit. So as long as you're staying with the body, you're not spinning out on anything because body awareness is mindfulness, right? You're rooting your mind in the present moment. The body sensations can only ever be in the present moment. So at least at that time, you're not spinning out, right? And with practice of body sweeping and really being you know, mindful of the body sensations in the meditation and throughout the day, then you do start to notice when emotions arise quite quickly before you react you start to feel something happening in the body, like heat might come up or the kind of the heart might start racing. And if you're sharp and if you practice this a lot, you can catch it before it spills over into unwholesome acts of body and speech. So the second part of the question, once you identify the emotion, it doesn't pass away immediately. <laughs> yes, but it's changing all the time. So it's not that the emotion was ever solid. Mm -hmm. It's not that, oh, there's the anger and it's this kind of solid entity that one minute is there and the next minute it's gone. What's more important than waiting for it to pass away is to see its nature as it's there. So to actually notice that in what you think of as anger, there's heat, there's pulsing, there's tension, there's, <clears throat> I don't know, maybe the heart is beating fast. Maybe you're even sweating if you're really furious and I'm sure you're not. <laughs> I, can't, I don't think you're a particularly angry person, but it's just an example. Um, so you actually stay with those sensations. You're not looking for the end of the emotion. You're looking at how it's manifesting right now. And once you start to see that it's changing all the time, that understanding of a niche of impermanence develops and it seems it starts to seem pointless to react. Like how can you react to something that's already changed? You know, when you wanted to react, that was maybe when it sort of reached a peak, but now it's kind of dissipating a little bit. So it makes no sense. And after a while, if you continue to use that perception of impermanence in your meditation, you feel everything just kind of falling away, arising and passing without really much permanence at all. So the equanimity can develop quite strongly. And, um, and even in the middle of an emotion, you're quite steady. The mind is quite steady and doesn't react. So yeah, once you identify the emotion, it doesn't pass away immediately. Good, because then it gives you a chance to explore it. So it feels like the emotion lingers on for a while and there's suffering. Yes, it's true. And suffering is to be understood, you see? So we can't go beyond suffering before we've met suffering, right? So there is suffering, and this is the first noble truth. You know, the Buddha wanted us to have a look at that suffering, to turn toward that suffering, and stay with it long enough for insight to arise. So if we want to push these things away too soon, we're still resisting that suffering. We're still not really seeing it clearly. And that's what keeps it going on. It's when we can bring that awareness to suffering and we can actually meet it and see, oh, look how I'm burning myself. That's when wisdom arises that can actually get at the root of the problem. Because the suffering is not really the problem. Of course, it is in the sense we want to, ideally, for those who have understood suffering to a certain degree, we want to end rebirth completely and get out of suffering completely. But as long as you're alive, you will suffer. There will be suffering involved. Even pleasant experiences have suffering innately embedded within them. You know, even, I mean, when I was practicing a lot of Vipassana practice, sometimes I would feel a lot of PT. And even as I was experiencing it, I could feel it as an agitation in the mind. It was an agitation on the stillness. It was more pleasant to feel still and to feel a sense of equanimity than it was to feel joy. So all of it is suffering. And that suffering is not a problem. 
it's the way we react to it it's the way we try to push it away and reject it and always looking for something better something different than what's right in front of us that is the problem and that's the bit we can change we can't really change the suffering as long as we're in this human form or in any form at all wow there's more than two new messages because there's many in each message so <laughs> oops it's nine o'clock oh my goodness okay so i thought there were two more messages but actually there were many messages in one so I probably won't get to everybody today. So, or I'll just give very brief responses now. So please forgive me if we run out of time. Okay. Mm. I would like to ask about self-kindness. I've some trouble with unhealthy food. I think I'm addicted to sugar and would like to treat myself more kindly. How could I better connect to myself and my body's needs? Good. So you've realized that you're addicted to sugar, you've realized that it's unhealthy and you already have self-compassion because you want to connect better to yourself and to your body's needs. So this is the first step and this is great. And you've identified this sugar addiction. So I think the best thing would probably to be set yourself small goals, not big goals. So, I mean, unless you're really strong-minded and you can just say no more sugar at all, um, it might be better to just start to limit, just start to cut down a little bit and give yourself a lot of encouragement whenever you succeed. If you don't succeed, don't worry, just ignore that one. But every time you do succeed, make a note of it, write it down and encourage yourself. And connecting to yourself and your body's needs better is through meditation. So you're in the right place. And especially if you do start to experience joy and peace in meditation, even just a sense of, I don't know, okayness, it doesn't have to be anything special, then you'll be less uh, willing to sacrifice that by engaging in unwholesome um, patterns of eating. Yeah, it's like we just start to feel a little uh, more circumspect about the way we live our lives. So I'm going quite quickly. Many years ago, I said to somebody <laughs> that all aversion was rooted in aversion to oneself. Oh, really? Yeah, I never remember what I've said. <laughs> I've thought about it and it seems to be so. Would you agree? Hmm. I haven't thought about it since I've said it. <laughs> so many years ago, I said that all aversion was rooted in aversion to oneself. Uh -huh. Probably what I meant is that it usually stems from unpleasant feelings. Like it usually aversion is around aversion to a feeling. You know, it's not really about the objects outside. It looks as though it's around the objects outside or the things that happen to us, but really it's about the way those things make us feel. And in that sense, it's rooted within ourselves. I think that's probably true that it is all rooted in ourselves. It's just that we're using the word ourself makes it sound like it's our fault or that it's a personal thing. But the main way that I would express it now is probably that it's all in the mind like aversion arises from the mind it arises from delusion basically but it arises within ourselves yes it's an internal experience and as such it can be rooted out internally we don't need to change the world to be free from greed hatred and delusion we need to change our mind so in that sense I think that is the case but I shall reflect further because I have not remembered that I said that it's very sweet that you remembered though <laughs> it's an old Dhamma friend. We've had many conversations about practice. <laughs> How can you deal with people trying to argue with you over things like eating meat? Oh, over things like eating meat is wrong and it's part of Panatipata precept or lying is okay if you lie for a good purpose. Um, just don't argue back. <laughs> that's just a quick answer because I'm not going to get through all these but it's actually quite a profound answer because the Buddha actually did say at one point he said the world argues with me but I don't argue with the world so I actually think rather than um, arguing back just carry on with what you feel to be right for you and just say well I respect your opinion but I need to do the things that feel good to me I need to follow what's true to me and um, you know I'll see if that if I'll see if that's right or I'll see if I'm wrong later on. But what tends to happen if you stick to your principles and your values is that people think, wow, OK, she's still doing that and she's still, you know, acting in a virtuous way and she's still not willing to, like, tell a white lie. She's got a lot of courage. She's got a lot of uh, 
um, conviction in her path, maybe there's something in that path for me, you know? And so you end up inspiring people by your own conduct rather than arguing with them. But if they're really nagging you and kind of getting onto you, then I would just try to set a boundary and say, look, you know, this isn't helpful for me. I don't want to speak about this right now. Um, you know, I accept your choices. Please try to accept mine. So that's one thing you could do. But yeah, don't be swayed and don't worry about it because people have to come to their own understandings and it takes different people different at lengths of time. So I'm just thinking about the time and if anybody needs to leave uh, because it's nine o'clock for us and maybe 10 o'clock in some other countries. So if you do need to leave, you're very welcome. I will not take offence, but I would like to continue trying to get through these in a slightly abbreviated way, um, maybe for another 10 minutes or so. Is that okay, co-hosts? Yeah, okie dokie. So it'll be another 10 minutes. As well as recognising our own virtue, is atonement a part of the practice? Ah, yes, this is an interesting question because in the um, little uh, verse that I read before or maybe it's a different one i think it's in the rahula rahula sutta i forget the actual name of it the buddha says that we should reflect on our actions of body speech and mind before during and after we do them and then he says if we find that we've made a mistake and we've done something harmful if we can catch ourselves in the middle of that action we can stop but if we only realize that afterwards, we can, hmm, how did he say it? We can reveal it to others, right? So we can reveal it. So this is great when you have a teacher, you can reveal it to the teacher. Or if you don't have anyone around to tell it to, just tell it to yourself, write it down, you know, make yourself aware of what happened and why. And the next thing to do is undertake future restraint. So you make a commitment to restrain yourself in future. And guess what? That is it. <laughs> so it's a very compassionate path. It's all about mental training, mind training. Uh, we don't need to beat ourselves up. But just have a look at it. Have a look at how it feels. What are the consequences as well? And the more you can say to the mind, look, mind, look, mind. If you do this, it ends up like this. This is the kind of result it gives. But if you behave this way, then this is the result. Then you'll be more encouraged to practice things that lead to wholesome results for yourself and for others. So that was partly why we did that kind of practice today, just to see if we can tune up to any particular quality in ourselves or just a quality we respect and feel what it's like to remember that because that will encourage us to perform it again and again. Okay, a pleasant, warm feeling used to arise in my chest area with loving kindness. It's no longer there. <laughs> Anicca vata sankara. Yes, well, just because it used to arise, I suppose things can arise for a while and then you think, oh, because it used to arise, it will always arise. But that's because we didn't see the impermanence in the arising. It's no longer there. I'm not making these feelings come up with willpower. Should loving kindness give rise to those pleasant feelings? Loving kindness can give rise to those pleasant feelings. It can be co-joined by feelings of warmth, feelings of ease, but it's not absolutely essential. Loving kindness is still loving kindness so long as you have the intention of loving kindness. Yeah, so it just depends, you know, so many things, everything, even loving kindness, even jhanic loving kindness is conditioned. It arises due to certain causes. And when those causes are not there, it doesn't arise or it arises differently. So we can't really understand why or how these things happen. But um, the causes are very nuanced and very complex. So it could be all kinds of things. It could be that you're tired of these days. It could be that I don't know, maybe there's more emphasis on the words of loving kindness. Um, maybe there's less energy in the mind. Whatever it is, it doesn't really matter. The main thing is to just don't keep on inclining the mind in that direction and trust in the power of those intentions to incline the mind in wholesome ways, because it will. You can't go wrong. You know, even if it's only thoughts of loving kindness, the Buddha says in the, I think, Vitaka Santana Sutta, or no, it's the Dweda Vitaka Sutta number 19 in the Majjhima Nikaya. He says that um, 
it's not possible when you have thoughts of loving kindness it's not possible for thoughts of ill will to arise so at that moment you should be very happy because at that moment you've overcome and stopped unwholesome thoughts coming into the mind so don't worry about the rest of it it will come back at some point too and when it comes back try not to cling <laughs> try to just treat it like a very beautiful little bird who's just come in to see you and you can fly out at any time so just with respect but it's good that you've had that and it's good that you continue to practice it's all good don't worry at all okay there's another quite big question about explaining how to use right effort in everyday life and in meditation so I can't explain it in detail now but it's basically just to define right effort as um, whether it leads to wholesome states increasing or um, and unwholesome ones diminishing if that's happening then it's right effort and the rest is a really a big experiment but we will definitely be speaking more about it tomorrow because that's the section we're on with Ajahn Brown so I can't get into that further now but it will be covered in more detail and you can also ask any of these questions again at any other time last question in my meditation when I'm getting distracted like today my mind wanders somewhere and I let it I observe it wondering yay I notice that the sense of bliss is crawling toward me then oh it's coming in but when I notice it and come back to focus on my breath which should make this bliss bigger and bigger it vanishes <laughs> so it's the should that is the problem here because why should it actually it's only because you think it should that it's a problem that it vanishes anyway which should make this bliss bigger and bigger it vanishes like a scared animal why and how to work with it probably there's a little bit of clinging toward it because when you're letting go and you're letting the mind wander and you're letting the mind basically be the bliss comes in as a result of doing less the bliss comes in because you're in a state of acceptance so possibly when you notice it you're doing something you say you notice it and then come back to the breath so this is probably the problem here because the doer comes back and the mind is not so relaxed and at ease anymore and also there's some wanting to keep that bliss going the craving gets in the way so craving is the cause of suffering remember right in the second noble truth craving is the cause of suffering so as long as this um you know doing something is also caused by the craving and uh in this case coming back to the breath probably you're coming yeah this idea of coming back to the breath and focusing on the breath is i think where most meditators go a little bit wrong because it's just a bit too forceful a better method would be perhaps just to carry on observing the mind letting it wander letting it do what it does experiencing the bliss coming in and just stay with that and at some point if the mind wants to it will also receive the breath think of it more as a passive thing that the breath will also come crawling towards you but you don't need to go out to the breath so i hope that helps i think that's probably what's happening here the mind's not quite ready for the breath yet so just stay with what you're doing a little while longer and don't worry too much i mean even when you do that and it vanishes it's all part of the learning process it doesn't matter you know you're just starting to to learn what happens and ask the question why so the question why is really for you you know i can give my like little theory about why <laughs> and maybe there's some truth to that but the question why is for you to this is where the meditation begins isn't it this is really where we start to understand the workings of the mind so you're doing good everybody's doing really well and um, it's been a lovely first day so hopefully it will um, continue and we'll become more energized today i'm very tired um i always come a little bit to life when i'm teaching because i love the dhamma and i like connecting but i'm um, actually i can see that my mind's a little bit tired and i would imagine it's the same for most of you so let's keep on relaxing try to get an early night if it's now dark in your time zone and we'll see you tomorrow so even sleeping meditation well sleep can be part of the practice and i would definitely encourage everybody who hasn't heard this from me before to 
as your head is on the pillow before you're actually asleep, see if you can just bring up thoughts of loving kindness, whatever you wish, you know, whatever you wish for yourself or for anybody else. Yeah, just something very gentle, very simple. It can be just, may I sleep well? May I be well? May I be peaceful? You don't have to spread it to the whole world. There'll be time for that later. So thank you very much. And I think we'll end here. Good night to those on Facebook as well. Bye.